Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I am the Director of Public Programs. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's discussion about the future of the California water supply. Throughout 2018, the Hammer Museum and the UCLA Sustainable LA Grand Challenge have been exploring the technology, infrastructure, infrastructure and ideas that can make Los Angeles the first entirely sustainable megacity in the United States. We call this series Future LA, Engineering a Sustainable Super City. Each month we're discussing one specific arena, such as building a sustainable energy grid, mobility and the future of transportation, and what the built environment is going to look like as our population grows. And those have all been videotaped and are available on the Hammer website if you want to see some of the past programs. Mark Gold is our moderator tonight, and he's going to start tonight's program by presenting a quick overview of the issues. And then our panelists will each give brief presentations here at the podium. And then they'll all sit down for a discussion with Mark Gold, and then we'll take audience questions. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the serious finance, governance, environmental, and water management challenges Los Angeles must contend with in order to achieve complete sustainability. Our panelists will discuss the impact of climate change on the city's water supply and ways to improve long-term conservation and infrastructure, including a move towards local water. So I'm going to give you a little background on the panelists, and then Mark Gold will kick off the discussion. Our first panelist is Neil Berg, the Associate Director of Science at the UCLA Center for Climate Science. Neil is an applied climate scientist with the overarching goal of increasing climate resilience and sustainability in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. His recent research focuses on changes in the California hydrological cycle, particularly how snowpack, precipitation, and extreme events may change in the future, and the impacts of these changes on California's water resources, energy security, and agricultural productivity. The research involves analyzing global climate models and conducting regional climate simulations using supercomputers. The second presentation will be from Erica Fernandez Zamora, the Director of Organizing at the Community Water Center, a nonprofit environmental justice organization based in California's San Joaquin Valley. Their mission is to act as a catalyst for community-driven water solutions through organizing, education, and advocacy. Zamora has a master's degree in policy, organization, and leadership studies from Stanford University, where she was also an undergrad. Her experience includes organizing, investigating, and ag advocating positions at the US Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, not sure that still exists, the Agricultural Labor Relations Board for the state of California, SEIU Local 2007, and the Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, which seeks to ensure the inclusion of rural regions in programs and decisions related to land use, water, environment, climate change, transportation, housing, and investment. Our final speaker is Adele Hodge Khalil, Assistant Director at the City of Los Angeles' Bureau of Sanitation, where he's responsible for the Bureau's wastewater collection system um, for managing that, storm water and watershed protection program, water quality compliance, and facilities and advanced planning. Under his direction, the city has prepared integrated resources an integrated resources plan for the year 2020, which will integrate water supplies, water reuse, water conservation, and stormwater management with wastewater facilities planning through a regional watershed approach. He's leading the city's effort in green infrastructure. He also serves as the president of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. He's a member of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers, a member of the American Public Work Association, and of the Water Environment Federation. So now I'd like to bring up our moderator, Mark Gold. Mark formerly served as president of the environmental group Heal the Bay, which is dedicated to making Southern California coastal waters and watersheds safe, healthy, and clean. Mark has worked extensively over the last 20 years in the field of coastal protection and water pollution. In particular, he's worked on research projects on urban runoff pollution, DDT, and PCB contamination in fish, and the health risks of swimming at runoff contaminated beaches. He created Heal the Bay's Beach Report, Beach Report Card and has authored or co-authored numerous California coastal protection, water quality, and environmental education bills. He is now UCLA's Associate Vice Chancellor for Environment and Sustainability, and he received his bachelor's and master's in biology and his doctorate in environmental science and engineering here at UCLA. So please join me in welcoming Mark Gold. Thank you. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, so today we're going to have a conversation about water. Um, and obviously, there really is uh, probably no more critical environmental issue um, in the state of California. Um, and if we just look at uh, water in the last decade here in the Los Angeles area, um, we've seen periods of extreme drought, um, followed by uh, near record rainfall in LA and record um, rainfall um, in the Sierras. And then now we've had a total of 5.2 inches of rain in the last 20 months um, within the Los Angeles region. Um, so we're really seeing you know, record temperatures, a lot more, a lot more extremes, and you're going to hear um, a great deal about that um, from Neil Berg, the next um, speaker. Um, to go along with that, there's uh, a lot that's been happening in the, just to give you a background, in the framework in the state of California on water. Um, in that uh, this year, there was legislation that passed uh, that was the uh, basically water conservation is a California way of life. Um, so that we're, we're, we're really not just going to be looking at water conservation from the perspective of is there a drought and let's you know tighten up our belts and turn off the spigot um, from the standpoint of, of dealing with the drought, but really the understanding that California has not been living within its means in its, in its water use and that we need to change that. And so it's a systematic approach really to reduce water demand um, literally on a water district by water district basis throughout the state of California. On top of that, we've seen um, what happens with the extreme precipitation events um, that we have infrastructure at risk. Um, for example, the Oroville Dam um, uh, and the spillway uh, suffered tremendous damages to the tune of $1 billion plus in repair. Um, for obviously the dam was not uh, equipped to deal with the scope and scale of the, of the storms that we saw in 2017 um, that really put um, literally tens of thousands of people downstream of that dam in tremendous peril and made us realize how important it is to start looking forward um, when we're figuring out um, the vulnerability of our uh, water infrastructure rather than the continual practice of looking the last century backwards um, and sizing our infrastructure in that manner. Um, and so that's, that's obviously a big issue. Um, the, other, the other issue um, uh, that's been current uh, is from the standpoint of replumbing the Delta and uh, the California water fix and the, the two tunnel project, highly controversial, very divisive, um, uh, but right now, currently moving forward, Metropolitan Water District, um, as well as Governor Brown um, and Department of Water Resources, um, uh, from the standpoint of moving full sp speed ahead on that project, lots of discussions on whether that should be a two-tunnel project versus a one-tunnel project, but right now, the $20 billion two-tunnel project is what's approved and moving forward um, at this point. At the same time, for the first time in many a year, the State Water Resources Control Board has put out their Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan, which um, has uh, recommendations. It's a draft at this point, but it's out for public comment on, uh, on really how much flow should remain in our rivers, um, the San Joaquin River and the Sacramento River, versus how much can be diverted for agricultural purposes or for human consumption. Um, and these are very, very controversial issues. And of course, California water is not limited to the state of California. We get a lot of our water supply from the Colorado River um, watershed as well. And uh, Lake Mead um, uh, right now is near uh, record levels of, um, uh, at its low point. Um, and very close to within the next year or two, we could actually see forced reallocation of water supply from the Colorado River system um, two, two states, most notably um, uh, the most junior rights go to Nevada and Arizona, um, they'd be the most likely to have cutbacks first. Um, but the Colorado River watershed has been in the midst of a drought for well over a decade. Um, and so you see the vulnerability of California water supply and what you're gonna hear from our speakers tonight 
um, is what can we do from the standpoint of moving more towards local water supply, the Sustainable LA Grand Challenge. One of our stated goals is for thriving in a hotter Los Angeles by 2050 is can we move to 100% local water? Um, we've had researchers, including myself, that have looked at this issue um, and determined that it's feasible. Um, it doesn't mean it's gonna be cheap, and it doesn't mean that we have the governance right now to actually make such a thing happen, but is, it is indeed um, feasible to do so. And we'll be talking about things that the city of Los Angeles is doing um, to really move towards a local water supply approach. And to put that in context, during the height of the drought, um, approximately nearly 90% of the water was imported to Los Angeles from more than 200 miles away. Um, and so that obviously is not sustainable. Um, and so now the goal is to get to 50% of local water um, by 2035, which is transformational. Um, and the county for perspective is 60% imports now at this point. And so whether the solutions are moving to local water using stormwater or recycled water or getting more out of our groundwater basins um, or even um, uh, the controversial um, use of desalination, whether it's brackish water desal or ocean desalination, um, those are the sorts of things that we could um, touch on tonight in this dialogue. So let's start with our speakers. Um, that was just to give you a context of what's going on um, in the state and some of the things that uh, we're, we're looking to try to move forward on at UCLA with the Sustainable LA Grand Challenge. And our first speaker will be Neil Berg from Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and um, our Climate Center. Good evening, everybody. We'll let these, these slides load for a second. All right, my name is Neil Berg. I'm one of the associate directors at the UCLA Center for Climate Science. We are a small team of researchers just up Westwood Boulevard. If you're local, please get in contact with me. Love to chat further. My email is right down here. Or if you're more of a millennial type like me, you can send me a tweet, Neil underscore UCLA Climb. Please just don't be a troll. I get plenty of them. <laughs> so I want to spend a few minutes today telling you uh, a summary of, of what I think are, are three of the biggest um, projected climate changes for the, for the greater LA region that have clear impacts to our water supply. All of these slides can also be found online. Um, and I have these, these URLs um, beneath here as well. And of course, you can stop me after the talk and we, we can talk more about any of those. I want to lead in with um, projected snowpack losses. Most of the water in LA is coming from collected uh, str uh, stream flow and runoff from Sierra Nevada um, snowpack and also um, some from the Colorado Rockies. So when we ask how LA's water could change in the future, you know, for me, the central question is how is our snow? going to change in the future. And what is shown here is a series of um, circles, colored circles. And the full circle would represent 100% of snowpack. And the colored inner donuts represent the amount of snowpack that remains for a given time period or a given type of future we could experience. So let's focus on this, this left, um, these left rings. This is for the middle of the century. So this is our projection around 2050, the amount of snowpack remaining in the Sierra Nevada under two different scenarios. The first one, which is shown by this orange-red um, color, is the business-as-usual scenario. And this is a scenario where we don't mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions, we don't rapidly transfer away from fossil fuels, and this is the track that we're currently on. So if we do nothing, we're on this orange curve. Alternatively, we could follow a mitigation pathway, and this is where we do rapidly transition away from fossil fuels. We take on much cleaner energy sources. We're reducing the amount of carbon and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, and that's represented by these blue lines here. So by the middle of the century, under business as usual, we don't do anything to mitigate, we would lose about a third of our snowpack by 2050. If we do mitigate now, heavily and continue that for the next few decades, only about 20% of the snowpack would be lost by the middle of the century. There's not a huge difference between those two scenarios by 2050. If we shift to the right bubble, 
end of the century, 2081 to 2100, that 20 year average, we see clear differences now. If we uh, don't mitigate, if we have a business as usual, only 36% of the snowpack remains. Two thirds of, of the snowpack across the entire Sierra Nevada we project to be lost by then. If we do mitigate, we can salvage about 70% of the snowpack. It's a clear benefit um, an argument for why we'd want to mitigate just for LA water resources. Now with so much uh, dramatic snowpack loss happening, we would have corresponding uh, pretty big shifts in runoff amount and timing in the Sierra. So what's shown here is graphically um, both the volume of runoff and the timing of it for the, I'm just picking here the end of the century and again, we're in this orange curve. This is the business as usual scenario. So each of these bubbles represents the amount of runoff happening aggregated across all the mountains on average for a month in the water year. So we'll start in October here on the left-hand side of the, of the panel and goes to the following year's September on the right-hand side. The, the size of each of these bubbles represents the relative amount of runoff for that given month. And so on the top, the top row is what we currently experience. These are historical runoff conditions. And you can see that from October through January, we have sort of a gradual buildup of snow in our mountains, not a lot of runoff. And that tends to peak in um, you know, late February, early March, and then spring arrives, temperatures warm up, and we have a massive melt event in the Sierras. And then we have a ton of runoff accumulating throughout the spring and summer. It replenishes our reservoirs, and that's what feeds us and our crops for the rest of the year. This is how all of our water infrastructure was designed in the 20th century, based on this principle. If we look at the end of the century, so 100 years from when that gray curve is developed on, we see two things. Um, there is a massive shift in the timing of runoff. So it used to peak. Um, in, the, in, in late April, early May. That's when the maximum amount of runoff was happening. Now we have a 50-day shift earlier in the season. Now late March is when that peak is happening. And it's not only just that peak, it's the total amount of runoff. So if you look at just January, that fourth bubble from the left, it wasn't historically a very big year for runoff. By the end of the century, we project it to be the biggest year for runoff. Now, historically, reservoirs are tend to, tend to be kept low in these winter months for flood control. Well, now we, we're going to be facing a trade-off where we might want to capture some of this, this heart of winter water that we would normally be getting later in the spring that we would need for the rest of the year. When we talk about extreme precipitation, this is something I think that... Um, is emerging in climate science as one of the, the most interesting changes that we're seeing across the board. We had a paper come out fairly recently um, called Whiplash. I don't know if any of you caught this on, on NPR or, or in the papers. Um, but what we found was that the number of extremely wet and extremely dry years are projected to significantly increase by the end of this century, both for Northern and Southern California. I'll unpack this a bit for you. So there's two maps here. On the left-hand side is the projected change in the number of extremely dry years. And on the right-hand side is the projected change in the number of extremely wet years. And we've divided that into a northern and southern half of the state. And the bubbles are just relative sizes where the blue represents the historical size. And then the orange, again, is for that business as usual. We don't mitigate at all what that projected change is. So the extremely dry year so this is the amount of, of precipitation we would have, um, for example, during 1976, 1977. And, and for the just sake of transparency, I wasn't born then. I was born 10 years after. So I didn't experience that 76, 77 drought. But it was uh, you know, one of the worst that California has experienced. We had a similar one in 2013, 2014. That one I, I was here for. So we experienced that kind of drought on average you know, once every 100 years. And that's what that, that statistic there, one every 100 years, we have those really extremely, extremely dry years. We project that that type of event, you know, that very low rainfall that we had in 2013, 2014, it is going to increase in frequency over two times for Southern California and close to two times for Northern California. So we'll have a doubling in the number of those very, very dry years for California. 
On the flip side of this coin, extremely wet years. This is like something that we had in 2016, 2017. I'm sure we all remember this. This is when we had the super bloom. You guys remember that? It was magnificent, you know, vegetation growth following a very dry year, 2015, 2016, very wet winter, um, which, which contributed to the wildfire outbreak later in that year. So extremely dry years, um, excuse me, extremely wet years, like what we saw in 2016, 2017, uh, we project uh, uh, an increased frequency 2.5 times, both for Northern California and Southern California. And so if you're increasing the number of extremely dry and extremely wet years, we have um, what we call whiplash. And that's the sequence of a very dry year followed by a very wet year. And it's it's a, it's a sticky situation for water managers to deal with when you're constantly going between these two extremes. You're managing for drought, and then you're managing for flood, and then you're back in a drought, and you're back in a flood, and you're having wildfires imposed on top of these. Whiplash years on the whole are likely to become um, two times as frequent um, uh, as we currently see because we're having both an increase in the extremely dry and extremely wet years. All of this, in summary, gives me grave concern for LA's water. People ask me all the time as a climate scientist what my number one concern is. And it's, it's these three findings. It's a dramatic loss of snowpack in the Sierra, which we rely on for our water right now. It's a massive shift in the timing and amount of runoff and its impact on our reservoir system. And then the third is an increased volatility in the type of years we have and the management of constantly going from droughts to floods, back to drought, back to floods. I think these three things are sort of the three-headed monster that scientists are tackling, that citizens will have to cope with, and I think together we'll be looking for solutions um, you know, to, to, to ride this out for, for the decades to come. That's my doom and gloom news. I hope we get on more positive topics in the panel, but I wanted to give you a, a quick overview of, of the latest climate science here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Erika Fernandez Zamora. I'm the director of organizing at the Community Water Center, El Centro Comunitario por el Agua. Um, we are um, a or nonprofit organization, an environmental justice organization. In the, our headquarter is located uh, in the heart of the Central Valley, um, but we also have an office in Sacramento doing policy, and soon we'll be opening an office in the Central Coast in Watsonville. Um, due to the need of having issues with water. Um, Community Water Center believes that all communities should have access to safe, clean, and affordable water. That is why we work as a catalyst for community-driven solutions through organizing, education, and ad advocacy in the San Joaquin Valley and soon will be in the Central Coast. The Community Water Center began because they saw a need in the part of the map that they didn't talk about, the Central Valley. These communities that they started working, that we started working with, not only um, experienced the recent drought of 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, but they have actually been dealing with contaminated water for decades due to the neglected and ignorant and ignoring the pro problem um, of the agricultural industry, dairies, and also of climate change. Our organization has been instrumental to work with local communities to find local solutions that will help solve some of the issues that they face on a daily basis. For example, Community Water Center help East Portoville, where it's an unincorporated community, rural community in the Central Valley that dry, that their wells, their private wells dried. This, their, their wells started drying at the end of the summer of 2014. This community did not have water for months and for some of the households for years. They had to create emergency, bring emergency tanks to some of the houses 
and t they created a community showers where there are communities and children would have to go. Thanks to the organizing and education that they that the locals decided to take on to solve this problem, uh, we were able to find a solution. But in this case, it took almost two to three years to be able to find a solution for this community. We were able to work with local agencies and state agencies to find that solution. And in this case, connecting them to the city of Porterville was realistic. But unfortunately, for a lot of the communities that we work with, that's not possible. They are far from places where they can connect. Some of these communities have high levels of nitrate, arsenic, and I could go on and on on the different issues that our communities have in addition to the ones mentioned. There's not enough water, and the water there is, the quality is not good enough. In 2012, our center um, helped pass the human right to water. California became, in 2012, the first state in the United States to pass a law. However, the example I share about East Portoville shows that even after passing the law, it was not enough. Some of, this, uh, some of these communities continue to have issues. And for us, we continue to work to find those local issues. But we also want to get to the root causes. And that means that if we have a law that passed that, make, that makes the human right to water a law, we need to make it a reality for the one million Californians that don't have access to clean water. There's communities right now that don't have access to clean water in, for schools, communities that actually have gone dry. And these are the communities that are actually are the backbone of the agricultural industry that keeps contaminating and taking away some of the water. We know where the problem is, and we know that climate change is adding more to the severity of the problem. And that's why our organization continues to focus on the root cause of the problem and focus on local solutions. And for us, we may have all the research, but if we don't work with the communities that are most impacted, those solutions will not work. This is an example of a one-size-fits-all policy. It's not gonna work. Some communities have issues with affordability, like LA, or, or under investment in infrastructure. Some communities have only private wells. So we know that finding a solution, will, one solution that will help all Californians will be difficult if we don't work together. We cannot see California as a northern, south, and central. We have to see it as a whole. We're in it together. And the reason we want to make sure that we continue working and the reason we're expanding, I would say other places would be happy to be expanding. The reason our organization is expanding because there's more communities having water issues. This should not be the case in the fifth largest economy in the world. These communities that are being impacted predominantly, disadvantaged community or communities of color, which are the communities that we work, are the backbone, like I mentioned, of the agriculture industry. And they're the ones that are mostly impacted. So today, my request for us is to not think of California as a Southern, Northern, or Central California. Community Water Center, yes, works there because that's where we started the work. We started working from one campaign and realized that one campaign was not gonna get it done. And even though we help has the human right to water, we still have a lot of work ahead of us. And we know that we are gonna continue working on the local and short-term solutions as we continue finding a reliable source of income. An organization has been working the last two years to pass the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. It was introduced as SB 623 by Senator Manning um, 
it has developed through the time through the last two years and mainly in the last couple of months. Unfortunately, um, the the speaker Rendon did not put it to the floor for vote this past legislative action. And even though our community and residents came and had a water strike the whole week, the last week of the legislative action, even though we worked really hard to get those votes that many said we would not be able to get, the speaker didn't put it to a vote. So today, I ask you to join the movement and actually fight with us already one million of Californians that right now, we're not even projecting to the future because that would increase. Don't have access to clean and um, to clean and safe and affordable water. They committed to continue working on finding long-term solutions. So I hope that all of you get involved in the next legislative session and help Community Water Center find at least a solution right now that will help at least with the funding. And also, if you're able to vote and encourage others to vote, there will be Proposition 3. And what Community Water Center is endorsing, because if it complements with the safe and affordable drinking water, it will bring some solutions for at least the private wells and infrastructure and operations of water systems. So I hope that you join the movement and you help us um, by either sharing and spreading the word or just getting involved. And so here are uh, our website. There's resources and more stories of success. Um, and there's also a lot of work ahead of us. So I invite you to continue to get involved and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Good evening. Great to see you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you. Uh, it's a great setup. I think, uh, you know, what Neil and uh, uh, what uh, Erica said, uh, you know, our water challenge is huge. Uh, and I think, to me, the positive side, I see the, half, the, the glass half full. I, I'm optimistic. I think in L.A., I think we're on the right path to make L.A. sustainable, but it takes a lot of things to get that done. It takes... I, I use the three eyes. It takes innovation, it takes integration, but most importantly, it takes inclusion and collaboration. It's, we're all in it together. We all have to solve this issue. We all have to commit to it. It's gonna cost money, but we all have to do it because our future depends on our investment that we're making today. So I'm privileged to be here, and I'm gonna talk to you about what we're doing here in LA. You know, LA became the great city because of water and flourished because of water and became LA because of water, but we have now a, more, a huge responsibility to sustain our future by protecting and harnessing our water resources, especially when it comes to rainwater and stormwater. And I think if we don't commit ourselves to conserving, capturing, and recycling more water, we will tap ourselves out. We have to transform our relationship with water. We have to deal with water differently. In Los Angeles, I think Mark mentioned, we import 85% of our water from somewhere else. However, every time it rains, billions of gallons wash down to the ocean, flooding communities, carrying pollution, and most importantly, being wasted. One inch of rain in Los Angeles generates about three billion gallons of runoff, which is enough to supply 20,000 households for one year. Also, we are still discharging a large quantity of our highly treated wastewater into our waterways and the ocean. This is the imbalance that we have to address, that we're addressing here in Los Angeles to become more locally sufficient and sustainable. In April 2015, our mayor, Mayor Eric Garcetti, launched an aggressive and progressive sustainability plan that established the goals and the path to make Los Angeles sustainable. Water management is a major component, a major element of the plan. It sets a target of having 50% of our water used in Los Angeles locally sourced by 2035. This is in addition to many measures that we was put in place, stormwater capture, water conservation, and water reuse. The plan also is recommended establishment of integrated holistic water plan, 
It's called the One Water LA plan. In addition, the mayor created a water cabinet that meets monthly to track and coordinate progress and projects. I'm here today to report to you that we have accomplished many of the plan goals and on the path to sourcing 50% of our water locally by 2035. Through water conservation and the leadership of our partners in Water Empower, our water consumption today is the same as it was 40 years ago with, with 1.5 million more people here. We have recently reduced our per capita water consumption by 20% through conservation and reuse, especially converting our front lawns and, and backyards to drought tolerant landscaping. Here in Los Angeles, I call it we're connecting the dots, drops, and hearts. We have to think outside the box. We have to think differently. Sometimes I say we have to throw the box away completely and think and start from scratch. We have just completed our stakeholder-driven 2040 One Water LA plan that sets the roadmap to meeting the mayor's sustainability goals through conservation, capture, and reuse while breaking down silos and identifying opportunities for integration, innovation, and inclusion. The plan will be launched virtually on October 10th, the same day as a national campaign of Imagine a Day Without Water. And uh, we have, I think, a lot of people here who worked on the One Water LA plan, staff, Ali Posti, and others. Can you raise your hand if you are part of the L One Water LA plan in any way, including Mark, too, <laughs> Mark, everybody. And if you haven't heard of it, please go find more about it. We have flyers, we have uh, information here, and, and share, because I think it's exciting. Dr. Williams came all the way from the uh, Northeast LA. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your support. El Sereno. Thank you. Whether it's rainwater, stormwater, recycled water, wastewater, or groundwater, it's all water, one water. The One Water LA plan focuses on engaging the public and maximizing the use of our resources and providing multi-benefits and leveraging resources. That's the key thing, multi-benefits and leveraging resources. That's the different shift that we have to make this happen. Water management cannot just be one focus. If you're building a street, let's make sure the street is green street, that's capturing runoff, that's addressing flooding, greening communities, uh, conveying more water so we can water our landscaping and the medians using recycled water and stormwater. We've done a lot. We've upgraded our terminal island treatment plant uh, in, in San Pedro to 100% water reuse plant. We're expanding the treatment plant in the Tillman in the Valley uh, to recharge 30 million gallons a day by 2021. We're also reshifting and changing the configuration of our sewer system. Instead of having the sewers go all the way down to the ocean by Hyperion, by the airport, we're rever reversing some of the flow, wastewater flow to Tillman where we have the biggest opportunities for recharge. We're building a new sewer system that will take it from the East Valley to the West Valley so we can treat it and, and recharge the groundwater aquifer. We're partnering with the airport, Lawa, on advanced water treatment at Hyperion to supply recycled water to the airport, but also we're partnering with West Basin Water District to reuse 70 million gallons a day more of Hyperion's uh, treated water. We're starting a project in the San Fernando Valley to treat and use the contaminated groundwater in the San Fernando Valley. There's a $100 million project underway right now in North Hollywood that will be complete by 2020. I think for me what I get excited is stormwater. Stormwater for me is, is the, the, the game changer. Stormwater capture, infiltration, and use has the biggest opportunity and benefits. By integrating and implementing green solutions with infrastructure as part of our watershed management plan, we can improve water quality, increase capture of stormwater, reuse of local water, enhance water supply, reduce flood, flooding, save energy, provide open space, green space, create jobs, and revitalize local community, especially the disadvantaged community, the community that has suffered for many years, the community that floods every time it rains. Let's figure out how we can address that and give the community something back. You know, one project that comes to mind, the signature project we're working with the county on, is in Sun Valley. We took a gravel pit that's right now being designed and is going to be built. It's called Rory Amsha Wetlands Park in Sun Valley, where we are partnering with the county and Water Empower. This project will replace a gravel pit that was a air pollution and a nuisance for the community. And a community that suffered for a long time uh, has huge issues with flooding and bad air quality. The project will capture runoff from 1,000 acres around the area 
treat the water through a, a series of wetlands in a wetlands park and take the water and, and recharge it into the ground while addressing flooding, increasing habitat, increasing biodiversity, and making the community a better place to live. That's really what we're looking for. That's the future we're looking for. That's the excitement about doing it. That's why the community now wants these projects built. I haven't seen, I mean, every time I go, Mark is part of our Proposition O Oversight Committee. In the beginning, it was hard to build these projects. You know, we had the NIMBY, now in my backyard project. And I say there's a huge shift now. People want these projects in South LA, in East LA, in the, the Valley. Uh, and, and everybody's coming saying, I want these projects. Now I say this, we, we are in the MB phase in my backyard. Build it, we build it now. But we have exciting things happening now. We have a huge thing and a huge opportunity be before us today. Measure W. How many people know about Measure W? Okay, you should go back right now. This is your homework. Find out about Measure W uh, on the November ballot. The Safe Clean Water Measure. It was developed by the county and the cities with the input from stakeholders, uh, environmental advocates uh, to fund our implementation of an enhanced watershed management plans to capture runoff, put it in the ground, address flooding, improve water quality, and give us what we want. For LA, if we implement these plans, we can capture and reuse more than 100,000 acre feet per year. Measure W is critical to our water sustainability, our water future. But more needs to be done. We are working on a plan to reuse 100% of recycled water Hyperion treatment plant by the ocean. We are upgrading our low impact development ordinance to allow for offsite compliance along with credit trading. We are looking at putting a lo low impact development requirement for public projects. We are looking at holistic solutions for improving, improving our streets, sidewalks, and urban forest. Interesting, on Friday, I'm honored to have been nominated by Mayor Garcetti to lead the street program. I'm, bec I'm becoming the general manager of the city's street services, taking care of the streets, sidewalks, urban forest, trees, and I'll be confirmed hopefully by council on Friday and take the job on Saturday. Um, but really what the, ex the exciting thing, thank you, thank you. Um, what's exciting for me is I'm gonna bring my integrated holistic sustainable concepts into real life, into real application, because I believe in it. I know it's gonna be done. And that's the only way for us to change how we plan the city, how we build the city, is to integrate all these things into our projects. Every project has to have a water component. It cannot be done alone. So I applaud you here for being here tonight. It's important that you're here because your leadership and commitment to a sustainable, resilient LA is critical to our success. So I look forward to working with you, making Los Angeles a better place and a better place for all of us to live. Let's imagine a day where every drop in Los Angeles counts, every drop is being captured and reused. Let's not imagine a day without water. Let's imagine a day with lots of local water. So thank you. Well, thanks everybody. Um, it was, uh, we covered a lot of ground um, from the standpoint of environmental justice issues and the human right to water um, to a climate reality that's looking pretty difficult and creating a bunch of challenges um, to uh, Adele um, where this glass is overfilling. Um, and so that's, I'm glad because for those of you who know me, it's good to have Adele be the opposite of me. So it's, 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 it's good balance in that regard. Um, so with that, there's a, the way we usually do this is uh, we do you know, about 15, 20 minutes of, uh, of dialogue um, between us, and then we open it up to the audience um, to, to get your, your questions on, on water as well. Um, so why don't I just uh, sort of start us off in um, human right to water. So let, let, let's, let's address um, that issue. Uh, you know, obviously, we you, you gave sort of a brief overview of some of the issues, and you know the fact that two and a half percent of the state of California doesn't have access to clean and affordable water is just absolutely stunning 
um, for the fifth largest economy on the planet, and you made that point very, very well. Um, so what, what would the mining bill do exactly um, from the standpoint of how would it generate revenues and, and um, you know, why is it somewhat controversial and what's your hope um, uh, from how it's going to uh, hopefully move forward next year? So the bill has uh, evolved, like I mentioned. It started two years ago as Senate Bill 623. And at first, uh, the idea of this bill, and I think I should have uh, mentioned it, but I will mention it. This bill, it's historic because it's the first time in the history of California where environmental justice groups uh, and the agriculture agriculture. Um, industry and dairies and, and government agencies are coming along to find these solutions. They are starting to come uh, to the realization that there is a, a water crisis in California and that uh, part of the issue is the agriculture and dairy. So um, the idea of this bill was for, um, there was a, a fee, the fertilizer fee. And so that's part of what would create part of the funding uh, that would allow uh, for to have a, a, a reliable source of funding. The other part at the beginning was going to be an opt-out um, for the, the uh, everyone's ratepayers from the state of California, uh, with the exception of low-income communities, because they're already already taking the burden. Some of them are paying um, not only for uh, contaminated water, but also for bottled water. So the idea that was the controversial part. Uh, making, in a way, what everyone thought it was a, a tax. We didn't call it a tax because we we uh, we saw the need uh, for the for it to have a sustainable. And some of those community systems are so small that the economy of scale would not allow for them to survive. And if they were to implement a, a treatment uh, for, like, for example, a, a nitrate treatment, um, they would go in debt or. It's just so costly that they wouldn't be able to sustain it. So that's where the first bill, then it evolved to the safe and affordable um, drinking um, water bill and most recently changed to another um, as Senate Bill um, A44 and um, Senate Bill A45. And this time the, the biggest change was um, that it was now voluntarily. Um, before it was mandatory, um, a fee. Um, we worked really hard to get the votes. Um, it was expected not to get the votes um, because um, there was already a recall and, and some, either both parties, uh, were afraid of, of getting recall. Uh, we definitely believe on an equity, equity standpoint that this should not be a matter of parties, that it should be a matter of a human right. And, and, and if we voted to have a human right law, that we should um, stay true to that, but we didn't. Um, so we worked really hard to have those votes. Uh, we did, uh, except that, like I mentioned, it didn't come to the floor, but um, we were hoping to continue because, again, it would be a historic because a lot of the money would actually come from the industries that are making um, the, the water contaminated, at least for the communities that have water right. because others um, don't have access so, to that. So, so for the audience, so what's interesting is that the agricultural community agreed um, to the fertilizer tax, which Correct. was which was a pretty big deal, because um, honestly it was going to help them because there was a potential liability for all the contaminated groundwater basins from from agriculture for literally over a century Correct. of use. Um, you can imagine dairies and, and, and ag on top of that, and then. What was interesting is that the Association of California Water Agencies, Aqua, um, was strongly opposed to both versions of the bill, even the opt-out bill, and to let people know if you're sort of following the energy side of the equation, we now have, Calf we have community choice aggregation um, in Los Angeles County, which is a big deal from the standpoint of trying to move the region into renewable energy, and that also is done in a manner where you opt out. So you can either join community choice aggregation or you can stay with Southern California Edison. It's up to you as the customer to decide. And that's exactly the same model that was being used here. That, that moved Metropolitan Water District from being opposed to neutral. They did not support. But um, that's, where, that's really where the controversy lies. It's like that we as 
the state should ensure and all put in some of our fair share to make sure that every single human being who lives in California um, has this human right to water. Um, and, and so what do you think next year to overcome that, that struggle and um, uh, to, to really get um, full acceptance from the legislature to make it happen? What do, you, what do you plan to do differently to make it successful? Well, we'll continue to put pressure in the legislative. I think we, we gotten close, but I know that there is opposition, but we truly believe that we're not talking about the future. We're not talking about when, uh, when we don't have enough water, when everything has gone dry. We're talking about communities don't have access to clean water. Right. School children don't have access to clean water, don't even have access to water. They have to shut down the schools. And this is, you don't have to go far to realize that they have to shut the schools because they don't have flushing water for their toilets. I mean, this is real in California, it's happened. You don't have to go outside California or the country to find those examples. We had a recent example of Strathford, the community got shut down, got a lot of media. I mean, we, we have a lot of examples of that. And I think for us to continue moving forward as a progressive state on trying to do climate change and not even being able to provide water, I mean, for those of us, I mean, I, we believe, Community Water Center, and I hope you also believe that, human right, that water is a human right, not a privilege. And it shouldn't be the case that because where you happen to live and the, and the places that you actually are bringing more to the economy, you're the being also the targeted to not receive um, the support from the rest of the states. It's less than a bottle of water, what you would provide if, if it was to be um, the opt out. It would be voluntarily. Some of these communities spend 10% of their salary in, in buying bottled water in addition to pay a water bill of contaminated water that is causing them health issues that then they have to also deal with that. And we're talking about that disadvantaged communities in the fifth largest economy. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Erica. That, that gives us a, a very different perspective that I think, um, you know, we, we take for granted a little bit, you know, if we're a DWP customer, um, uh, you know, from the standpoint of we always have safe, affordable water, and you don't even have to go outside of Los Angeles County to look at Sativa or Maywood or Compton and, and, and some of the water quality issues there. Um, and we've had uh, uh, researchers at UCLA, um, J.R. DeShazo, um, uh, in particular with his team, um, and uh, really look at this issue and the fact that we have um, these really small water agencies that are not able to provide their customers with safe, clean water on a regular basis. And so a lot needs to be done. So thank you for, for your leadership on that. Yes. Mark, Mark, on the national level, as part of my role in NACO and others, actually we're talking about for the sewer system and for water systems. There's a huge movement nationally to look for uh, integrated utilities across counties, across states to help really build the economies of scale, to help communities that can't afford the, the, the work, to ensure that we have safe sewer systems, safe wastewater system, and safe drinking water. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a huge movement across the country. Right. So, so it's really, it's gonna help us all. We have to take care of each other. Right, and, and just so you know, for those of you who follow UCLA research, there's even uh, research, um, Yoram Cohen um, has a team working on remote, um, uh, 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 basically satellite operated um, treatment facilities um, because a lot of these rural agricultural areas are nowhere near um, water treatment and distribution systems. And so to be able to actually pump and treat and have mobile units in places like the Salinas Valley and the South San Joaquin Valley has to be part of the solution. So, so there's a use for technology here as well. Um, Neil, let's, let's sort of shift gears. And one of the things that's most exciting to me about the work that you're doing um, uh, with Alex Hall and others at the center is um, really trying to move um, uh, you know, global climate um, uh, models, downscaling it, to really look at very real world practical issues on water management. And um, you're really making some tremendous headway from the standpoint of actually predicting not only snowpack but also really getting a better handle on precipitation and flow. 
And that's been a real struggle for people working in this field for the last 20 years. What are the obstacles that you're facing in trying to give better predictions to water managers? And how are you guys overcoming those obstacles? Yeah, that's, um, that is the central driving point for our lab right now. It's, there's a technical challenge and there's a human challenge. On the technical side, if anyone is familiar with the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this is the IPCC, they come out with these big reports every few years. All those reports are based on global models and they have a spatial resolution. So the grid cells in those models are um, about 100 kilometers wide. So essentially like all of LA would just be one data point for this, these models. And on, on global scales, that's okay because LA is not that different on a global scale. But if you're a resident of LA or of Southern California, you know, Santa Monica is quite different than, than downtown. You know, there's a huge gradient within the city. So what our lab has been doing is developing um, techniques to translate that global scale information down to the neighborhood scale. And that's where we got all those projections from. So um, the data we're producing is, is down to, you know, uh, on the order of, of, of a few kilometers, so just a couple miles wide. To get there, we had to invest in a huge computing infrastructure. Um, we had to leverage supercomputing resources across the country that are run by national laboratories, um, and there's a little supercomputer on campus as well. Um, there was a huge amount of innovation. Uh, all of this stuff is just sort of being developed now and has been for the past 10 years or so in the whole climate science field. And it's actually been a huge um, amount of support from computer scientists who've, who've helped climate scientists get to where we are now, um, leveraging their kind of parallel massive computing systems. So once the technical challenge was um, solved to get down to this scale, there was a human challenge. And this was um, essentially connecting climate scientists with water managers, those in the water community, and hydrologists. So. From the outside, people think that climate scientists um, are experts on kind of everything in the climate, you know, the, the ocean and the atmosphere and the land and vegetation. And the truth is that most, most climate scientists are quite specialized. And so I, I, I had very little hydrology training. I had very little, very uh, civil, you know, limited civil engineering knowledge. And so for the past few years, our lab has, um, really done a lot of deep engagement with the water community and it's been a huge amount of humility on our end we just there was so much to learn and rather than just dumping data down to the water community watershed managers or water utility companies we've actually been pulling them into the research process from the very beginning and saying what what is your biggest concern with climate change what are your biggest data and information gaps what, why aren't you solving the issues that you're facing right now? And how can we, on the scientific side, develop new tools, data sets, visualizations to get you to the finish line? And so it's actually been a real inspirational co-development of these data sets. And um, it, it, I think it, you know, what you were saying earlier, it, it really has been a joint effort between engineers and scientists, advocates, politicians, to um, not only overcome the technical hurdles, but then applying all that data for real world applications. And it's being applied and it's being applied successfully because the people that need that data or making decisions on that data are engaged with us from the very beginning. So, so what makes precipitation harder pre to, to predict than temperature as an example? So, so what are, what's the struggle there on why is that why has that been a little bit more difficult to, to do accurately? Yeah, precipitation is a, is a challenging variable for California um, for a couple of reasons. The first is that we so rarely have an average year of rainfall. We, we actually just sort of live in an extreme s regime here. You know, it's actually kind of strange because I, gr I grew up in Baltimore and on the, on the East Coast, it basically just, just rains all the time. Huh. And I, when I moved to California um, about you know, 10 years ago, I, I was like, it, it just doesn't rain. And then, then when it rains, it really rains. And um, that is a hard, uh, those extremes are hard to capture. Um, the, it, it's much different than, than temperature, where there's sort of a gradual 
you know, decline or, or, or incline or decline of it. Um, so just the, the volatile nature of precipitation makes it much more harder to simulate. And then going forward, Southern California finds itself on the node between two large scale changes of rainfall patterns. The northern half of California will very likely become wetter into the future, and south of Southern California will very likely become drier. And this is something called the wet get wetter and the dry get drier theory. Most regions that have a lot of moisture will be getting more moist, more wet, and those that are dry will be getting even drier. And Southern California is right on these two climate regimes of very wet Southern California, very dry subtropics, Mexico, et cetera. And so Southern California is in this precarious position where some of the projections say that it will get a little bit wetter. Some will say it will get a little bit drier. And on the whole, they say it basically is no change because those two projections sort of cancel each other out. I don't know if that uncertainty is going to be decreasing anytime soon. I, I think whatever future comes to pass will likely have a small shift in the average rainfall for the region, but I do think there is very strong evidence, as I showed in my talk, that um, the averages aren't that interesting, but it's those very wet and very dry years that will both be increasing, and I think I, I have a lot of confidence that, that that will come to pass. Right, and so in that, in that perspective, looking at the storage system in the state of California, um, even though we've had this extremely dry last um, 20 months here within the Los Angeles region, the state of our reservoirs in, in California is actually pretty robust. Um, and that has had to do with doing an extraordinary job of capturing rainfall in 2016-17 that has just carried over to this point. So we can actually withstand, from a storage perspective, another couple of years like what we're having right now, but um, it's sort of living year to year, maybe two years to two years. Um, and from the standpoint of trying to figure out to how to get more of those peak flows and those wet years into the ground for storage in the San Joaquin Valley where there's just so much groundwater storage um, is really the next big thing that we need to tackle as a state in water management and that has not really been um, paid adequate attention to. But I think you're gonna start seeing situations where projects will be proposed and farmers will be paid to fallow their crops in areas where you can um, have greater recharge. Um, and we're seeing big studies from UC Davis um, on the efficacy of that sort of approach right now. Um, so look for that more in the future. Adele, um, so you've been you know, is from my perspective, you know, the visionary in the city of Los Angeles really trying to push, prod, cajole, inspire um, uh, the city to uh, really this local water approach. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of challenges in making that happen on, you know, not only in Los Angeles, but also to serve as an example for the rest of the mega city of Los Angeles as well. Um, so uh, why don't, you talk a little bit about, um, since you're optimistic, those challenges in... in that was 15 minutes ago. <laughs> so I've ruined that. Um, but, uh, you know, from the standpoint of wh what's really needed to make... What we're really talking about is a transformation in the city's water ethic, not only from a cultural perspective, but literally also from our infrastructure and, and how it looks and, and, and how, do, how do you see that occurring in the next couple of decades? So just want to add one thing just before about Neil. I think from the operational side, you know, it's uh, as a operator, when it floods, I mean, I have to respond. I have to deal with the flooding. We're looking at sea level rise, et cetera. But the thing is, a funny story I'll just tell you to help. In San Pedro, I think it's like 2014, 2015, I can't remember, we had flooding, huge flooding. So I go to the community, homes flooded, the whole area floods. And I tell the community, I'm sorry, this is a 100-year storm. It's a, it's a, oh, this is freak 100-year storm intensity. The next day, same thing happens. Floods again, the same thing. And they say, what happened? 200 years turned back to back. So to me, it's, it's the lesson, I think, what you're saying, I think, circle that we all have to think about, especially academia, is we have used history to design for the future. When it comes to climate change, history is no longer valid. So what is the 100-year storm? What's the 20-year storm? What's the 50-year storm? We need to rethink it. And that's where your science comes in. That's where your data is going to help us 
change our design standards, design our, our assumptions. It's going to be risk-based. This is really what the, the new shift of design, like everything else, it's going to be risk-based. How much risk are you willing to take and how much money are you willing to spend? That's the change. So I'll go from that one. Let me shift to your question, Mark, is, is how are we going to change that? I think we've done Angelinos, I think, on the last drought and the call by the mayor and you know the efforts on education and outreach and conservation. I think we've done a good job. And people are really continuing to do a good job. And I think it's their commitment on the water conservation. But I think we need to change that. It's, it's how the infrastructure is going to be built. So we did in 2012 the Low Impact Development Ordinance requiring all new developments and redevelopments in Los Angeles that are building more than 500 square feet to capture runoff on site for reuse and infiltration. That's a requirement by law. Every development has to do it. So we're shifting now, trying to say, okay, is there a way we can do it where you can, a developer can go take a property along the LA River that's ideal for capture of stormwater, uh, uh, treating it, uh, reusing it, but it's not in his development or her development area, but it's cheaper. And maybe for us, it's probably the best place to do that capture, to revitalize the community, to address a need. We're looking at changing our law to allow for that to happen. So when you go do something somewhere else, you'll get a credit. You can apply it to your development. That's the thinking, the change, and how we're going to develop this. But also, I think the big thing is, is how we, you know, we are talking about planning and breaking the silos. But I think the biggest things that we need to break is money. Money is still out in silos. Street money, measure M money, measure R money, <laughs> flood control money. Everything is somewhere else. And when you start asking to try to pull money into a common project, it becomes difficult. Everybody is kind of protective of their issues. Federal laws do not allow you in some places to use money for a bridge or transportation project to do stormwater capture, infiltration, and reuse. Can we see metro projects doing that? I mean, this is a really shift in metro. Metro is looking at sustainability now as, as a key element. But I want to see them push the envelope and do more of that as building as they're building projects and improving transportation across the city to do that. So I'm excited that we should have that requirement. I, I talk about streets and, and now I'm stuck with streets, right? Which is a good thing. I'm, I'm happy because I gave the example before. I said, if your requirement to design a street is eight inch thickness based on the load of the traffic, because you only have, you know, 80% of the money, do you reduce that to six inches? Or do you do the right thing? You don't do a six inch street. Can we make water capture, water storm water capture as part of this whole discussion? How can we make, how can we change that discussion? <laughs> but also, can we build a storage system? I know Deb Deese is here. We built the first water silo in, in San Pedro and storm water capture, so it's great. Can we build these things across the city? a cistern that sits in that captures stormwater, that we can irrigate our medians and capture stormwater for when it rains, but also bring recycled water to it somehow to have our city become green. Because I think a sustainable city is not a gray city. A sustainable city has to be a green city. So we need to have that balance, and it's a change. And, and also what I think the biggest challenge for all of us is this uh, balance between beneficial use of our waterways and increasing water reuse. That's the thing that we're dealing with right now. It, the more we recycle, the more we capture, the less water in the LA River we're gonna have. Because the LA River is purely, 80% of it, if not more, is, is water from our upstream reclaimed water plants that we need to reuse. During so can dry we, weather. Yeah. During dry weather, yeah. But can we change that to capture it? And during rain, can we put inflatable dams? Can we build storage that can help us with resiliency, that we can tap into it and rewater? All these things are possible, but we all have to come together. We have to get the money. So remember, measure W, measure W, right? Remember, that's uh, it's your homework for tonight. And, and that's how we're going to change things, but it has to take commitment from our leadership. I'm glad that we have great progressive leadership in Los Angeles. The mayor is pushing all of us to move the needle and continue moving it. But I think we need to also look at ways to remove obstacles, especially when it comes to money and leveraging money. There has to be some kind of a freedom in that, in that arena to make us be able to spend it on these integrated solutions. So um, 
for additional sort of scientific perspective on the city, so uh, as part of the Sustainable LA Grand Challenge, um, UCLA, working with Colorado School of Mines in partnership with the city of LA, looked at a lot of the sorts of issues on what would it take to get to 100% um, local water. And, um, and just, so, just so people realize, the sorts of things that are being discussed in earnest that are part of the One Water Plan um, uh, potentially um, moving forward is you start looking at our coastal sewage treatment plants like Hyperion um, and you look at that from the standpoint of the discharge every day and that could potentially be water supply um, the same way that the Terminal Island treatment plant as Adele brought up earlier has turned into water supply. Well that's, you know, that could be an additional 100 to 200,000 acre feet of water supply which is up to 40 percent of the city of LA's water demand on an annual basis, which is about 500,000 acre feet for, for 4 million people, um, just to put things in round numbers. Um, and so on stormwater, on stormwater capture, we as a region do a decent job in stormwater capture in the San Gabriel River. We don't in the LA River. Uh, roughly 270,000 acre feet in an average year go into um, uh, uh, San Pedro Bay at the Port of Long Beach. Um, and so that's, you know, again, roughly 50% of the water supply. It doesn't mean you're going to capture 100% of it, but um, it makes you realize there's a lot of local water that we're not getting. And because our groundwater basins, because we've urbanized this city and we've had so much industry for decades and decades, we have really contaminated groundwater. Um, and so we've kind of turned our back on it as a, as a whole. Uh, the federal Superfund program has not been successful in getting these groundwater basins cleaned up. Um, sort of a good news, bad news scenario is the more that imported water has become more expensive, the more that local water, meaning pumping and treating contaminated groundwater, is actually now very, very cost competitive with imported water. So the point is we really need to change our relationships with our groundwater basins in an unprecedented way and really clean them up at the same time as we're providing public water supply um, as, as a potential way forward. So these are all exciting opportunities for the city um, uh, to transform. And as, as Adele correctly said, Measure W um, would really go a long way from the standpoint of, of everything from urban greening, helping out flood control, um, local water supply with stormwater capture, and of course making our rivers, beaches, bays, and lakes finally safe for people in aquatic life. So direct, direct, direct potable use uh, is, is an area that I thought we should also talk about because one of the things we need to do is change the laws to allow us to have, I think if we have the, the ability to directly use the water from our water reclamation plant, highly purified, safe, clean, it will change the game. It changes, it takes away the cost of a conveyance and the cost of having to find a place to recharge it. Now it's part of your water system. Uh, we drink it in other places. The people in New Orleans drink water that has been coming down uh, the Mississippi River from different communities all the way up. This is highly purified water. So the yuck factor has to go away. It's technology is there. We have the advance. Let's change a lot to make it work. So, so in the state of California, um, and San Diego is probably going to be the first major city to take advantage of it, it is legal to take recycled water and co-mingle it in a surface water reservoir. It's been legal with, for groundwater for many, for many, many year, decades. Um, but now it's legal to do that in the surface water. And so if you've heard of the San Diego $3.5 billion pure water project, that's what they're talking about. Um, potentially for LA County, whether it's with the city of LA and Hyperion or the LA County sanitation districts with their sewage treatment plant in Carson working with the Metropolitan Water District, um, you could potentially by 2028 or so um, uh, to 2035, somewhere in that realm, if the laws change, where you would actually pump the treated sewage water to your water filtration plant, where it would co-mingle with the other water, and then get served directly to the public. And so that's something that, that could happen technologically. It's feasible. You get the uh, extra buffer of the uh, water filtration plant before it gets served. Um, and so those are the sorts of things that people are talking about sort of for water management in the future. Um, with that, I think it's great to open it up to the public and, and get some questions and hopefully we can get some, some uh, uh, answers on uh, continuing the dialogue. So with, if the people with the mics can sort of choose the people walking around, choose the people answering questions, that'd be great.
We have a person right here. Thank you. Um, my question is, uh, with all the talk I hear about uh, the importance of our urban forest in stormwater capture and lowering temperatures, um, really the city of LA hasn't done hardly anything at all. We're just beginning to work on an urban forest management plan. Uh, you look at the mayor's sustainability plan, it mentions trees four times and with no specific numbers. Um, you look at the 2015 urban water management plan, in all 800 pages, I can't claim to have read every word, but there's no mention of the urban forest at all. Mm -hmm. So it's great to talk about <laughs> vague generalities, but when is the city of Los Angeles gonna start actually talking about dedicated water for the maintenance and expansion of well, the urban forest? Adele starts Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, a lot of people, actually one of the things that we need to do, I agree with you 100%, the stories that you see now, there's a lot of trees being planted uh, across the city, especially in disadvantaged communities. Uh, we're doing a lot of work. There's actually a watering crew now that takes water and, and waters the medians, but I wanted to change that dialogue. So you're right, there's an urban, there is an urban forestry management plan being developed, but actually there's actually a metric that we're measuring to, to plant trees. I will take on, I'll make sure that that's being communicated because that's the thing that we sometimes we don't communicate fully and we need to be transparent, but also we need to change the game and put it in a different level. So. Water is a key element, I acknowledge that. So that's my, my thing is how we can create sustainable streets, sustainable systems and communities because you know it's all about the, the, the heat effects and, and the cooling effects and the trees and the canopies, but also sustaining it. And we're doing tr trimming. For the first time ever, for a long time, this quarter by this end of this month, we would have trimmed 6,000 trees. We haven't done that in a long time. So we're doing well, we're working hard, but you know what, it's, it's gonna take a lot of work and I'm excited to have a chance to transform that department. And, and so obviously the carbon sequestration and air quality benefits of trees are needed too. I would just encourage everybody in the audience who's interested in these issues, it's a really good opportunity to make yourself heard both at the city of Los Angeles as well as the county of Los Angeles because the city of LA is, is doing a refresh of the sustainable city plan and so they're really looking for feedback from the public right now on these exact sorts of issues. And the county, for the first time ever, is doing their first sustainable county plan that UCLA and Borough Happolt are partnering, working with the county and actually developing. Um, and so this is really a good time to make your voices heard. Um, next question. Whoever's got a mic. I definitely would agree with that. You all need to get involved if you want things change. I think there's already a lot of things happening that it's tapped down. You have, if you want things to change, you have to hold them accountable. If not, we'll continue to see the same patterns, regardless of the topic, if it's forest, if it's water, if it's climate change. If you don't step up, things will continue to be the same way. All right, next question. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for the panel this evening. Um, I have a question. I recently uh, founded a startup, and our interest is monitoring and ensuring the quality and safety of water at the point of use. And my colleagues on the East Coast tell me that um, communities all over the country are facing these water contamination issues in part because our distribution systems were de designed to deliver a certain capacity of water. And as conservation and sustainability measures have been put into place, our consumption goes down and now we have water aging in our system and that leads to degradation of the treatment chemicals, higher risk for exposure to lead and legionnaires and all of these things. So um, my questions are, one, is this actually true in LA? Because I'm not sure if that, that is an issue with our systems. And secondly, if um, considerations to those sort of issues with our distribution systems are part of the plans for the city going forward. You can take it first. I mean, I'll try. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you, it's not an issue. Right. Water quality is not an issue in Los Angeles. We still have enough water. And also, by the way, we have a advanced system uh, in, in terms of flushing the system and actually reusing the water back. So it's a, it's a very complicated. I don't work for Water and Power, uh, but they have a robust water quality, uh, water supply, monitoring, and flushing of the system in, in areas that have stagnation of water to ensure that it's, uh, it's flushed. And they're using it, reusing the same water. It's not being wasted as it used to be done in the old days. But, you know, more can be done. I don't know the details, uh, but I will assure you that water quality is safe. In other communities, like on, on Detroit and other places, it's, it's the whole community basically went by half or, or, or 
last two-thirds of the community. It's a huge issue. Uh, for us, I don't think we have that concern. Uh, but I assure you, and we will uh, we'll talk about it. The distribution system is part of the renewal, so there is a huge effort for distribution system renewal, and it's under by Water and Power to uh, uh, take care of and renew the uh, water system. So, so I, I would just add one thing. So going beyond City of LA, looking at LA County, I, I think I think the 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 issue that you're bringing up is a little bit overly simplified on on the complexity of the problem. Yeah. And so, um, you know, Eric has obviously eloquently talked about, you know, the water quality problem from individual wells, and, and that's a very different problem than old infrastructure, and that's, that's hitting, a mil you know, almost a million people. Mm -hmm. um, but the other part that I think is very, very important that, that most people don't appreciate is that, you know, most water agencies are only in charge of the main infrastructure. So the laterals that actually go into the buildings, whether it's your house or an apartment building or you know, a commercial establishment, et cetera, that's, that's the private landowner's responsibility. And that's where a huge part of the water infrastructure in not only in LA County as a whole, but really nationally is completely undervalued from the standpoint of what the role that plays in the problem. And so um, I could spend an hour talking about it. It's not, it's not I don't want to spend the rest of the time doing that. But that's, that's something where the resources are not there to upgrade individual um, uh, distribution systems on private property, even in our children's schools. And that's something that um, we really need to take a hard look at. And I'm sure, Erica, you want to add something to yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. I think, I again, I could speak more on the... San Joaquin Valley, but I think part of why we continue to push for the safe and affordable drinking water fund is that we it would help with the infrastructure and operation of some of the system, and also to um, basically renew some of the the um, the infrastructure to to get the water to places. I think in Fresno County you have schools with lead, um, so I think some naturally occur uh, contaminants are happening also. Just that, just the pipelines that we're using that they have leaks and they create other kind of materials. So I think there is. I would definitely. I think what we ask always uh, to our community members is like, do you know uh, what's in your water? So I think even though it may not be the city, the city of Los Angeles issue, but the county, there's some some communities near you that are suffering from having, I mean, some some contaminants, you cannot see them, you cannot taste them, but they're there. And some others, you can actually see them, the water is brown. So I think, it's, I think it is moving forward, one of the things that we can do is to continue promoting that awareness of like, know what you're in your, what is in your tap water, and because a lot of communities actually have toxic t tap waters. Thank you. Um, anyone else? One. No, I'm Up waiting. There. No, I'm waiting for the you guys pick she someone. And give them, oh, okay. go ahead. Sorry, I'm blind. Hi, um, I want to honor the fact that there are issues with rural community water issue, you know, um, access. But I would was my question is to Adele and Mark to maybe talk about what we can do to help the urban poor who there's a huge percentage of people that are disadvantaged live in urban environments, and how can we help them um, understand how good we have our water, uh, you know, when we consider that the mayor last year on Tap Water Day said that uh, tap water is better than bottled water. Why do such a huge percentage of our urban, um, you know, poor spend probably 10% of their income on bottled water. What, what can we do about that? It's, this is, you know it's not sustainable. And so I wanted you to talk about how we can help the urban uh, poor um, have access, you know, to the water that they already have. Yeah, and, and, know, and I'll tell you, on, personal, on, on a personal level, actually, I saw that. And, and you know, I see, uh, especially in, in communities that have those corner stores where you can go and get water or whatever, and um, to me, it's all about tr trust with the water. And many of our immigrant community uh, has a lack of trust in their water. So they come with that, you know, the ability to not trust water. So our responsibility that we need to get out and, and provide the education to the schools, to the community, provide education in various languages, 
to ensure that there is that trust. So it's going to take a trust. Uh, so we need to recognize that that's what's needed. I know there's a huge investment by our water and power for outreach and education on it. And I'll make sure I take that comment because that's critical, is making sure that we reach everyone. I, I say it, and I was writing my comments for my Friday uh, <laughs> confirmation meeting with council. I wrote a note that says, every voice counts. Every voice in LA, it doesn't matter where you are. Every voice should count. And the way that voice counts is we need to understand and communicate with them. Uh, at, at the time of the day, when they're working, when they're not working, what language, all that, that's critical. So we need to do that, and I think through education, outreach, uh, and, and working through the community members. And, and, and I think Saturday, for example, we have our neighborhood congress in LA. A lot of people don't know we have that, but we have Saturday at City Hall, if you have time, it's a great event. All the communities across the city in Los Angeles, across the 90 plus neighborhood councils come into the chamber, into the city, into sessions on water, sessions on streets, sessions on this, and it's diverse community. And those are ambassadors that go back to the neighborhood council. I know Dr. Williams is one of them that goes out and goes back to their neighborhoods, to the neighborhood councils to educate. But we have a responsibility here to ensure that we invest in that. Measure W, I want to go back to it, so it's a critical. <laughs> if, you haven't, if you don't know anything about it, go find it and look at it. It's for water and winning, W. <laughs> uh, actually, there is actually part of the funding measure. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there is actually a lot of work being done. I can't advocate for it too much. I'm, uh, you know, it's a very difficult position for me. Uh, <laughs> but I'm an advocate for it. <laughs> uh, you know, there is actually a, a, a language in the actual uh, structure of the, 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 the measure to provide 10% more funding in disadvantaged communities. So whatever the community pays out in taxes for the fee, they'll get back 10% more. So that's, that's right. a change in the culture. There's actually ambassadors being funded through this outreach effort. There is actually watershed uh, uh, community members being put out there in the community to communicate that. That's the first time I've seen a shift and how is that being translated in a measure? So I, I'm, I'm excited, but I think more needs to be done. I, I, I think that those are great, great answers. The, the only thing that I would add is that, um, you know, these smaller water agencies that aren't DWP, um, there, there are some issues at Sativa um, in Maywood and Compton, um, among others. And um, the reality is, as long as those situations occur, then um, it just is more difficult to do what Adele's talking about and to effectively do that communication. And to that end, frankly, you know, we need the state to be more forceful on consolidating um, some of these smaller agencies and making sure they're part of larger agencies that have a, a much better um, history on reliability and clean water and providing it to, to the public. Um, and, uh, and that's a controversial issue. People want local control. Um, but the reality is, you know, I think clean, safe, reliable water is, is, is worth that trade-off. And that's something that's a, that's a pretty controversial issue right now that the state is struggling with pretty heavily. The other thing is the, the water quality monitoring, people look at that from the standpoint of a compliance issue. We have to start looking at it even in these small water agencies is it's really to build consumer confidence. You know, by showing that you have a clean bill of health in your monitoring program and really testing for the chemicals that people are, con are, are so concerned about and you can show we're not finding these at all in the water that we're delivering, that can provide consumer confidence. And we're not doing as good a job as we should on that. The word's not getting out as well as we, as, as well, as well as we can. So there's progress to be made there. I definitely want to add something. I know that I work predominantly with rural communities, but the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund would also help urban disadvantaged communities. And in terms of the organizing, which I am the director of organizing, I think I feel that in order for us to continue engaging those communities and to be 
on the table making these decisions and actually be involved in whatever project, even if in academia, I d we definitely have to have their input. And we need to engage them, and that means we need to organize and educate them uh, so that they could become advocates for themselves, regardless if they're urban or rural. And I think that could be transferred in either of the communities. And I think we should, as citizens of California or residents of California, we need to continue looking as a whole because there are communities that are exp spending more, but there are also that we're not getting to them, that we actually neglect to like ignore their points of view. And so I think in that sense, I agree. Um, there's con consumer confidence reports, but if you don't take the time to explain to them what does that mean, what, what a primary or secondary contaminant is, it, they don't mean anything. Especially if they're in English and you're talking about communities that don't speak English, then it doesn't matter. It's like sending them anything. I think we all have to consider and get more involved at the, at the local impact of how these communities are constantly being disproportionately impacted even though we're all in it together. Yeah, you, you can imagine you're, you're in a disadvantaged community and someone tells you when you have brown water, don't worry about it, it's a secondary contaminant. That, that just does not help on yeah. consumer confidence. All right, last question. Hi. I, oh, oh okay. sorry I about that. Last two questions. Then. Sure. Oh. <laughs> Sincerely, sorry. Okay. Um, so I wanted to try to attempt to frame the issue and the complexity here a bit. Um, so. In terms of advocacy, data research, you know, uh, and trying to garner, you know, all 88 cities of LA County into one sustainable plan, um, time, uh, attention, and uh, funding is all limiting factors for all of that, like consistency with being able to uh, be consistent with whatever it is you're advocating for advocating for. So this is kind of like a regional issue. What I'm curious about is that regional issues are probably best solved with multifaceted approaches. In, and I would like if you might be able to expand earlier your little uh, point when you mentioned about funding models or grants and how there's like kind of a siloing effect with particular funding models. And if there's a possible push towards expanding the flexibility of funding models towards these types of regional efforts. Uh, maybe if that way we can see so, if there's kind of a progress towards this so plan. Let me, let me pitch another. Let me pitch another thing next. Next on 27th at Metropolitan Water <laughs> Metropolitan Water District. There is a, uh, a a conference by the Southern California Water Coalition on stormwater and uh, stormwater delivery and 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 how we're going to be able to fund and look for leveraging. Uh, to me, it's, it's bottom line is, it's, is we need to figure out what the benefit and assign the benefit to a, a cost and have that be paid. So if flooding comes from flooding, uh, if it's a uh, water quality should come from water quality money, if it's water supply replenishment comes from water supply. I think we all have to agree that there is a relationship and if there is a, a, a recreation and park benefit, it comes from that. So let's figure out how we can leverage those and, and those models are, are, are great ways of doing it, but we need to figure out how we can assess the benefit and have them pay for it, because a lot of it may not be as clear and visible to make that clear assessment. Wait, wait, one thing I would just add is, is, is a simple example that's being pushed for and has been for quite some time, is that stormwater capture the 100% of the burden has fallen on local government and the water supply entities have really not invested in it. So they haven't looked at really, um, and this is a generalization, you haven't seen Metropolitan Water District really invest in a big way local resources in stormwater capture. Um, so uh, you know, if the scientific community, which is something UCLA um, is looking at right now, partnering with USGS um, as well as Colorado School of Mines, you know, can, can demonstrate that for every acre foot infiltrated within a certain community that you're gonna get X volume of augmented local water supply, you're far more likely to get Metropolitan Water District to say, hey, we'll give you, um, for example, 250 to $400 an acre foot for that additional local water supply. Right now, um, there's not enough certainty in the infiltration practice where you're seeing the water utilities invest in this sort of green infrastructure 
um, for nature-based solutions to augment local water supply. And I think that's something that's just has been long overdue and has to change, but it's not gonna happen until we actually have the, the robust um, science and models to help make that happen. Last question for Dr. Dorsey. Congratulations, Adele, for your uh, promotion. <laughs> and I got a question for you about that. <laughs> Whoa. Person HR? What? No. Yeah. Uh, and it's not about that W thing, okay? Um, how do you plan on now bringing street maintenance into the fold of One Water LA? And what are some solid projects you might have in mind for that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the way it's going to be brought You're in. You're welcome. By, uh, <laughs> thank you, John. By the way, it's going to be brought in by me bringing me in. Uh, <laughs> so, so to me, it's, it's bringing me in. But you know, I, I, I'm very optimistic. There is a huge, uh, you know, uh, street maintenance is, is and, and by the way, one of the things I want to do, there's a lot of great things I want to do, is a stakeholder involvement process in developing a holistic, integrated street plan for Los Angeles. That's going to be done. We're going to have that in place. And, and we're going to be engaging everyone to develop a holistic, integrated plan for Los Angeles for our streets and infrastructure. So that will be in place. Uh, that's going to develop a plan. There'll be metrics. There'll be deliverables. But, you know, the staff I've talked to in the field, the people I've, I've been talked to already since the last two, three weeks, there's a huge thirst and excitement. They want to do the right thing. They want to do the right thing. And I know with the leadership uh, in our city and, and around us and the communities asking for this to be done, I think they'll do the right thing. I'm, I'm excited about it. But remember, Measure W is what's needed. That would help us. All right, so on, on that note, and I can't wait for um, uh, Adele to also go after uh, Metro um, and some of that Measure M money to make sure that some of the transportation, since transportation is related to our streets, that yeah. we can really make a difference there I'm, and green I'm, streets. I'm gonna knock at every door. Good. Um, so um, uh, everybody, uh, please help me thank our uh, panelists tonight. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming out and sharing in this, uh, in this discussion. And as you can tell, there's a very challenging uh, problems that we have here in California um, in water management. Um, the, the future looks a little bit scary. Um, but at the same time, you're seeing innovative solutions that uh, really can really move the state for the first time towards a real sustainable water management ethic. So, so there is reason to be excited. Um, and w what's on November 6th again? I can't remember. W. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Prop 3. No, uh, <laughs> w, W, W. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.